Hello everyone. I hope that the fellows and residents who are watching this talk are signed into the Yale Connect web link so that I can acknowledge their answers to my question. Today I'm going to start my series of talks on cranial nerves. For each nerve I'll go through the normal nerve anatomy, the relevant brain, skull, and neck anatomy, pathology, which include infection, inflammation, tumor, denervation, atrophy, and trauma, and also focus heavily on perineural spread and the appropriate cranial nerve. It's very important <coughs> in studying the cranial nerves that attention is paid for the course of the nerve all the way from the nucleus to the end organ, the innervation site. So today I'm going to start with part one of the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve is maybe the largest nerve and covers a large territory and you can see the distribution to, on the skin, the forehead, the face, and the lower face. Uh, so basically the trigeminal nerves supply sensation to the scalp face and the mucosa of the nasal cavity, sinuses, and the mouth. All of these uh, structures are derived from the first branchial arch. There's also another component which is part of the mandibular nerve, and that's the, the motor division of the trigeminal, and I'll go into detail later with all these various muscles when I talk about the mandibular nerve in another session. Now, why am I pointing out this lesion? Anybody would like to answer on the chat system? That's right. As Daniel just answered, this is the region of the nucleus of the fifth nerve. This patient presented with one month history of facial pain. And if we look at this diagram, we can see that the two components to the uh, trigeminal nucleus, a small motor component and a part of the larger uh, sensory component. So this is the correct location for the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. And here's some, so this patient initially had a brain study and then a month or so later had the study of the cervical spine. Anybody want to come up with a, what's the condition with this patient? Very good. Both Gino and Dan made the right diagnosis. This patient is suffering from MS or multiple sclerosis and in the, the initial findings on the brain, which was the only lesion in the brain, was involvement of the trigeminal nucleus explaining his initial symptoms. Now the interesting thing about multiple sclerosis, it tends to not infrequently involve the root entry zone, which is where the trigeminal nerves uh, leaves the pons uh, or enters the pons, as we can see in this lesion, in this location. This was an interesting case that I had at the VA the patient was sent down for a stroke workup. He had multiple prior strokes, and the neurologist wanted to know if the patient had another stroke. There were no evidence of a stroke, but he had this lesion at the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve. So I called up the neurologist, and I said, you know, could this patient possibly have MS? And he said, no, now that you mention it, the patient has some funny sensation uh, in his mouth. Uh, 
and he then worked him up for partial MS and a CSF diagnosis of MS was made. So it's important to pay to attention to lesion in this location at the root entry zone. So again, this lesion was in this location, uh, the root entry zone of the fifth nerve. Here's another patient, had four or five months of trigeminal neuralgia, and again, notice the lesion in the region of the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve. as in this diagram. Here's a patient had acute lymphocytic leukemia, again involvement of the trigeminal nucleus region in the parents. Now you may recall this case that I showed last week, the case of hypertrophic olivary degeneration. They had came in over several near years, had uh, bleeds in the ponds, progressively larger, and ended up with these classic ch changes in the medulla of hypertrophic olivary degeneration. Why am I showing this case again? These images I did not show before. Why am I showing these? Anybody? Very good, Gino made the correct diagnosis. There's denervation atrophy of the a portion of the muscles of mastication. And why did this happen? Because if we look here at the location of this bleed and the eventual gliosis, this is the close to the location or involved the location of the trigeminal nucleus. Uh, and that's why the patient ended up with these denervation uh, atrophy changes in the muscles of mastication. So again, this was involving the motor division of the trigeminal nerve because of the abnormality in, in this location. Again, the muscles of mastication. Now, why am I showing these two images? One in the medulla was abnormal signal and one in the brainstem at the level of the peduncles. The reason I'm showing these is because of the extensive size of the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. In yellow here is a motor which is very relatively small and limited to the floor of the fourth ventricle. However, in blue is the extensive sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, which extends all the way from the superior cerebellar peduncle, we, um, su superior colliculus, all the way down to a level of C2. So it's a massively elongated uh, sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Now, in, in uh, the requisites from a book by uh, Kretschmann and Weinrich, which is reproduced in sensor, we see all the levels of the sensory nucleus uh, of the trigeminal nerve. So here in the medulla, I found some appropriate cases. Here's the location of the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve lesion in this location, slightly higher, the location of the sensory was appropriate image of the patient, going slightly higher in the medulla, the location of the sensory trigeminal nucleus, and here in the ponds, low ponds, we see the location, and here in the mid ponds, we see both the motor and the sensory with appropriate lesions here. As we come up higher in, in the ponds at the level of the superior cerebellar peduncles, which we can see here, again, a lesion involving, involving the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. 
and even higher at the level of the peduncles, we can see the lesion, and here's where the nucleus is. Higher up in the brainstem, the sensory nucleus, and here's the lesion from the literature, a melanocytoma, which patient presented with V1 and V2 symptoms. Way up high, the lesion was in the course of the <coughs> sensory uh, nucleus. You may not, and most likely will not remember all these locations, but just it's important to keep in mind the full extent when patients present with trigeminal symptoms and you see lesions which not just at the floor of the fourth, but along this entire course. I just want to point out that, that the upper portion of this sensory nucleus is proprioception. And the level of the fourth uh, ventricle is touch and lower down towards the med medulla and upper cervical spine is pain and temperature. Okay, so the last two sessions I covered the peduncles, the corticospinal tracts, and the various, the dentorubal olivary pathway, and also the various uh, tracts of the uh, sensory uh, uh, system. Now I have to we have to deal with the trigeminal lemniscus and the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract. These are difficult structures, as you'll see in a minute. Again, to remind you, a lemniscus is a sensory tract, and we'll be talking a lot about the trigeminal lemniscus. This very informative diagram shows you what is happening to the trigeminal fibers. Here are the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve. At the level of the pons, the proprioception fibers and uh, touch cross over to the opposite side and then ascend in the trigeminal lemniscus all the way to the thalamus uh, where they end up at the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus. And from there, the fibers go to the cortex. However, the fibers which deal with pain and temperature, instead of crossing over immediately, travel down all the way down to C2. And uh, these fibers are called the, the spinal trigeminal tract. Uh, and they then cross over uh, at the level of about C2, and then will continue superiorly and eventually join the trigeminal lemniscus with the, fi the proprioception fiber, and then they will travel up uh, towards the thalamus. So when we start looking at, at MR imaging, uh, things get a little bit complicated. Because we have, at every level, especially in the medulla and the pons and the brainstem, we have two structures uh, on each side that we have to contend with relating to the trigeminal nerve. The first one is the trigeminal nucleus itself, and then we have the trigeminal uh, lemniscus. So on each side, we have two, total of four. So here, for instance, be the location of the trigeminal lemniscus, and this lesion would be at the level of the nucleus. At the level of pons, again, we have the, the level of the nucleus, which here is on, unfortunately on the opposite side. So this would be the nucleus, and this would be the trigeminal lemniscus. Again, nucleus here, lemniscus over there. Higher up, the same thing in the 
at the level of the superior cerebral peduncle, the nucleus would be over here and the lemniscus is over there. So there are two structures on each side. And even at the level of the cerebellar peduncles, we would have two areas to, if we have lesion, to think about the trigeminal nerve. One is the area of the trigeminal lemniscus and the nucleus, which is pretty, so they're pretty close together. And here, for instance, again, the case I showed before, the melanocytoma with V1 and V2 symptoms, you could see it's involved in the region of the nucleus and also the level of the trigeminal lemniscus. Now, and here's an interesting case. This patient had left chin and left lip num numbness and has also left ankle pain. And we have a, le a lesion here. So can we tie this to the patient's symptoms? That gets us back to these diagrams. This one that I talked about last week and this one today. This is the trigeminal system and this is this, the sensory. As you recall that the fibers from the, the spinal fibers uh, and the sensory fibers from the po posterior columns went superiorly and ended up in the fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus. At the same time, and then they would cross over into the medial lemniscus, which is a sensory tract. At the same time, there were spinothalamic or pain and temperature fibers that crossed over at the appropriate level and then f f be uh, became part of the spinothalamic tract. So we, and these together join with the posterior column fibers to form the medial lemniscus. So we have two, two tracks here, the medial lemniscus for the sensation and the trigeminal lemniscus in, uh, in a very similar location, except that here we have the two sides. So again, if we look at, these, at this diagram, here's the trigeminal lemniscus, and very close to it is the medial lemniscus, one from sensation from the body and one for sensation from the head and neck. They're very close together, but the issue is, you know, one of them is crossed and one hasn't crossed, so it can get complicated, but you have to kind of tie it in together with which side the symptoms are. Here we have the patient with left chin, left lip numbness, and left ankle pain. So we have the, in green, the trigeminal fibers, and here we have the medial lemniscus. So the close location you can see by the position, but we can explain that this lesion in involves both the medial lemniscus and the trigeminal lemniscus, and that's why this, pain ha this patient has this constellation of uh, symptoms. Here's another patient. The patient has left facial pain and leg numbness, likely MS lesions. Again, notice the lesion here and this again encompasses both the structures, the medial lemniscus and the trigeminal lemniscus, explaining why he has both lower extremity and facial symptoms. Notice that these are close together, one next to each other. I know it's complicated, but this is just to explain if, you know, why we have certain constellations of symptoms. Here's a patient who had a cavernoma that bled in the pons. Patient present again, numbness of face and hand and foot symptoms. So everything can be tied together if we understand that the medial lemniscus and the trigeminal lemniscus are close together.
as again seen here, medial lemniscus, trigeminal lemniscus. Now here's an interesting case. What we see here is abnormal signal all the way from the pons going down to the upper cervical uh, cord. Anybody have any ideas what this condition may be and what's involved? Very good. Gino again came through with a diagnosis. Of course, this is the trigeminal uh, tract going all the way down. I reversed the slide so it fit this diagram. So here's the trigeminal tract going down to C2. Notice how the D the degeneration goes way down from the pons to the medulla, medulla, and this patient had shingles and, herp and herpetic neuralgia. And we can even follow it further down. Notice, notice, notice all the way. Remember the fibers are on the same side of the patient's uh, the left face because the fibers for pain and temperature uh, that are going down to C2 have not crossed yet. They will cross over here. That's why the symptoms go along with, uh, with where the position of the, the left side position of these abnormality. So the entire tract all the way down is involved, the trigeminal tract. So again, we can see these lesions here on the T2 images and here the diagram showing the position of the trigeminal uh, nucleus. And here's another case from the literature. Again, patient with herpes showing involvement of the trigeminal tract going down to the medulla. Also in the Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, you may have, again, involvement of the trigeminal nucleus and tract seen on MR. Again, to remind you that Ramsey-Hunt syndrome uh, is caused, again, by the varicella virus and the same virus that causes chicken pox and shingles. Here's a, another very unusual case. Patient presented with seven days of face numbers in, all the way from the throat to the mouth. And we see a large, long lesion here involving, again, the location where you expect the trigeminal fibers to be. Anybody, any idea what this may be? Very unusual case. Again, notice how this is similar to the sensory tract of the trigeminal nerve, again involving at the, where the trigeminal nucleus would be sitting at the various levels. This was a patient who had listeriosis, a very unusual case. And notice again, following enhancement, you can see the entire trigeminal tract all the way from the nucleus along and then at the root entry zone. And notice on the coronal image how it looks so similar to this diagram, uh, a, a portion of the sensory and nucleus. And then here, and then the enhancement and all the appropriate position of the lower portion of the trigeminal nucleus. Now, we have to be cognizant of this low position at the level of C2 of the trigeminal nucleus. There's a paper, you know, if you have a patient who has trigeminal symptoms and you do an MR study of the head, 
and there's nothing there, you at least should take a look at, at the cervical spine because uh, herniation over cervical disc may also present with trigeminal symptoms. And here's a paper, trigeminal neuropathy caused by cervical disc. Another thing which was unfortunately a complication of C12 punctures is that when it, the puncture was not done carefully and there was a, a puncture of the cervical cord, some of these patients presented afterwards with uh, trigeminal symptoms. Again, because of this pos posterior position of the tract and the needle in trying to avoid the, the spinal cords inadvertently hit the, the cord and patient ended up with trigeminal symptoms. Okay, why am I showing this tiny stroke in the region of the thalamus. This patient presented with right facial numbness. And instead of just saying a small stroke in, in the thalamus, we now can be much more precise and say this is the cause for the patient numbness. And again, if we go follow the trigeminal fibers, medial limni the trigeminal lemniscus goes up and ends up in the ventral posterior vent medial nucleus of the thalamus. That's for the fibers from the face, trigeminal fibers. And if we look now in this anatomic diagrams, this is the VPN, the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus in the coronal plane, and here it is VPN in the axial plane. Remember that last week, when I was talking about the medial lemniscus, that those fibers ended in the ventral lateral nucleus of the thalamus. So we have two nuclei uh, that are important in the thalamus, the ventral posterior medial a uh, ventral posterior lateral nucleus is for the proprioception uh, fibers, and the ventral posterior medial uh, is for the face, uh, which come up the trigeminal lemniscus. And these are very close together, as we can see. This is on the axial plane, the ventral posterior medial for the trigeminal, and the ventral posterior lateral for sensation from the uh, lower and upper extremities. And you, these are two separate patients. Here's one patient presented with facial numbness, and this patient presented with right arm numbness. And lo notice these positions are close together, although slightly different uh, when you relate it to the midline. Now here's a hot case from September 5, our resident Gao, he heard my talk last week and he, he sent me an email saying, I have a good case for you. And here's a very excellent case, which I was very happy to see. This was a patient presented with right facial numbness and right leg numbness, both symptoms. So here's the lesion. You can see it on diffusion, a tiny stroke in the thalamus. So what we have here, again, as I pointed out before, the ventral posterior uh, nucleus, the, the medial nucleus for the face, is very close to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus for the sensation from the posterior columns. So here on this case that Gao gave me, the lesion just involves both of these nuclei. So it's a great case explaining why the patient had facial numbness and also leg numbness. Again, on the coronal plane, here's the lesion, and again, you can see involving the ventral posterior lateral and the ventral posterior medial 
explaining this dual symptomatology. No need to look further. This is the reason why the patient had these constellation of symptoms. Now, here's a patient has an infarct and presents with right facial hyperesthesia and burning. And we can see why, because this location kind of encompasses where the fibers of the trigeminal nerves go towards the root entry zone. So you can see why uh, this lesion would cause trigeminal symptoms. Now again, as I showed last time, the distribution of strokes in the pons and medulla is very precise territorial distribution. In the center, for instance, at the level of pons, we have the perforators coming off the basilar artery. And then there's another territory here which is supplied what they call the short uh, circumferential branches, and these are the long circumferential branches. So these are all kind of separate territories uh, supplying, and that's why the infarct may be in, in different locations. Here's another stroke, again, involving where the fibers from the trigeminal nerve will be coursing, involving kind of this location by the short circumferential branches. I'm just showing this very interesting case to show this distribution. This patient uh, had occlusion of both vertebral, I mean, uh, of both verts. And notice the strokes sparing the midline, but involving these two lateral positions, just like in this diagram. This territory was involved, this territory was involved, but the middle territory was spared. Okay, here was a patient, shows a stroke in the lateral aspect of the medulla, a little bit posterior as seen on the flare. What condition are, are we dealing with now? What is this known as? Correct. As Stefan just uh, wrote down, Wallenberg syndrome. This is what's called the lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. This, because at the level of the medulla, this is the ter territory supplied by the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the pica. So classically, when you have a pica occlusion, you will end up with a lateral medullary syndrome. And again, if we look here, this is where the trigeminal nucleus sits, and this is the same area where there was an infarct. The lateral medullary syndrome is extremely complex with all these findings. Uh, I just want to focus on what we talked about already. We have ipsilateral face pain and also temperature problem and contralateral body pain, touch, and temperature symptoms. And then the, all these other, these relate to the ninth and 11th nerve, uh, which I will discuss when I uh, talk about those nerves. But th these two we already covered, so that's why we have contralateral and ipsilateral, because you remember these fibers have not crossed yet until they get down to C2. Here's another patient presenting with Wallenberg syndrome, again, the stroke uh, involving the region where the trigeminal nucleus would be sitting. And here, not that obvious a lesion, but again, if you c play the windows correctly, you will find there was a tiny stroke explaining why this patient had a Wallenberg's or lateral medullary syndrome. This was a 27-year-old came in with severe neck pain and ataxia, 
following vigorous exercise. What abnormality are we seeing here? Anybody? What is involved? Correct. We have, this is a dissection. Both Stefan and Asif mentioned that. Notice the difference. Here's a normal vertebral artery. Look how thin this one is. Here on the sagittal view, the normal vert, and as it courses horizontally above the lamina of C1, and here very deformed and abnormal. And this is really what happens. See, in a normal position, when there's marked uh, rotation of the head or twisting, uh, you really, this region gets very compressed and is, is susceptible to causing disruption or damage to the wall of the vertebral artery and will end up sometimes with this kind of a dissection as we can see on so this is un what unfortunately happened to this patient a dissection of the vertebral artery at this location and here's the sequelae on MR again so a Wallenberg type syndrome again a stroke involving the posterior, the lateral aspect of the medulla as seen on the DWI, uh, on the ADC, and also seen on the, on the flare image. And here we can see on the MRA we see the nice left vert, but we barely can see the, the right vert. So this is the region of the dissection just as seen on the CTA. Here's another patient presented with facial numbness and headache. What do we have here? Anybody? Again, as Stefan Asif said, dissection, Wallenberg syndrome. Again, DWI, ADC, classic location. Again, trigeminal nucleus sits here, explain, explain the patient facial numbness. Here it is on the coronal uh, flare, not as obvious on the T2. Again, this is where the nuclear sits, explaining why the patient presented with facial numbness. Here's a CTA on the same patient. What does it show? Again, Saying Stefan Rasef, abnormal vertebral artery and the foramen transversarium. Notice again 
the thin abnormal appearance of this left vertebral artery compared to the right. I like to look at this coronal view of the CTA is very helpful because it shows the best this area of the vertebral artery which is susceptible to dissection. So again, on both planes actually we see the lack of normal flow here, the thinness of the vessel compared to the normal side on the axial plane as well as on the coronal plane. And again, the same problem of extent of marked rotation of uh, twisting causing the damage in this uh, location. And this is the last slide that, that I'm showing. Again, I just want to stress the extensive long uh, course of the trigeminal sensory nucleus all the way from the level of uh, the superior colliculus down to C2. So when you have a patient where the clinician talk to you and has trigeminal symptoms, but don't just look at the pons, look wherever the course may be, all the way from the collic superior colliculus down to C2. And if you see a lesion with, uh, which you more or less remember is where the sensory course of the nucleus is, that would be very helpful to, the, to explain the reason of the symptoms to the clinician. Next, this is the end of this talk, and next time I will be talking about the cisternal portion and the normal course and the abnormalities of the cisternal portion of the trigeminal nerve. Thank you.